education to me is the worst industry. The underlying reason for it, uh, reasons, there, there, there are a number of them, but one of them is that the in the U.S., um, you've got private schools, which are just like corporations. Sometimes they're nonprofits, sometimes they're for profits. And they've always sort of functioned very bottom line oriented. You also have what are called um, state schools, um, land grant schools, where individual states would literally donate land and a university was created. And the, and the understanding was is that the university was a public institution owned by the government. And it was its mission was to educate the residents of that state. And over the last 30, 40 years, very few of those schools have followed that mission. I feel like we're living in one very long episode of Breaking Bad. Someone <laughs> on Twitter wrote, Canada is a nice, friendly country living on top of a meth lab. For many groups, there's nothing normal about this new normal we're all living in today. And that's especially true for college students. COVID-19 has completely upended college life. Hi, this is Peter Clayton with Total Picture Media. I wanted to talk to, with an expert in college recruiting to get a sense of how the pandemic of 2020 is impacting students, faculty, uh, administrators, and recent grads. And boy, do I have one. Joining me today is the founder and president of College Recruiter, Stephen Rothberg. College Recruiter, launched in 1996, is the leading job search site used by students and recent graduates of all 7,400 plus colleges and universities who are seeking internship, part-time jobs, uh, seasonal work, and entry-level career opportunities. College recruiters' customers are primarily Fortune 1000 companies, federal government agencies, and other employers who wanna hire dozens, hundreds, or thousands of students and recent grads each year, or as Stephen likes to say, we provide companies with people at scale. <laughs> so Stephen, welcome back to Total Picture Media. Thank you for taking time to speak with me today. Awesome to join you. And as a, as a former Canadian, I'm a dual citizen. Um, I totally get the remark about, the, about the, 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 the neighbor downstairs with the meth lab. Yeah. Yeah, well, that makes two of us because I I was born in Canada as well. So, uh, yeah. Tell us uh, about the journey your company, College Recruiter, has taken since February, March of this year. Uh, yeah. How has COVID changed your business? So College Recruiter is is owned um, 100% by my wife um, and me. We have about at any given time roughly a dozen employees, um, contractors who are sort of regularly doing work um, on our stuff. And... COVID did not impact our business at nearly as much as it did some others in, in sort of a negative sense. Um, and, and we feel fortunate for that. One reason that it didn't is that we were, our radar was up more than some others because a relative of ours in the UK was one of the very first people in the Western hemisphere to contract COVID. He got it in January. Um, he got positive, and then he spent two whole days with our daughter, who was on her way to the Czech Republic for a study abroad program. She didn't know that he was positive. She goes to the Czech Republic. He then tests positive. British health authorities contact the Czech authorities, and she was civilly committed. She was basically locked up for about a week um, wow. and had to go through what was then very painful testing procedures, the, the swab that I've had a few times that I think probably a lot of people that are listening to this have probably had now, um, that used to go way up into the nasal cavity and it was painful. And uh, they didn't speak English other than one doctor. So it was kind of a frightening experience. And this was right at the beginning of February. I mean, at the beginning of February in the US, it was kind of like, eh, well, you know, maybe this is a thing and maybe it's not, but, but it, we knew, nobody really understood or very few people anyway, that this was gonna fundamentally change the way that almost everything works. Um, so we were well dialed into this and we could see from what was happening in Europe, Italy at the time was under lockdown or pretty shortly after that Spain went. And so we started to get our wheels in motion and we were one, we were one of the first companies to get the PPP, the Paycheck Protection Program um, loans. Our bank was fantastic with us. Um, all of our employees have worked remotely since 1997. So we didn't have any of those issues to deal with either, you know, even just getting laptops out to people. So the business transition was a lot easier. What happened with us too, is that um, certainly business slowed down a lot in, in March, 
It was mostly due to the disruption because all of a sudden you had companies where everybody would be working on site and sending everybody home and kids were coming home from school. It was super disruptive as a society. I think it's hard to remember just how disruptive that was. It was only six months ago. April was kind of recovery time. People were starting to get back into the groove, but the U.S. was so under sort of quasi lockdown or people, companies didn't really know what was happening. There were very few companies other than like the Amazons of the world that were doing any kind of hiring. Um, our business started to rebound in June. We had a, one of our best Julys ever. We had our best August ever and September will likely be our best September ever. And I think that one of the reasons is, is that like you were mentioning earlier, that our business, the, the service that we deliver, the job search site, really excels for employers that are hiring at scale, dozens, hundreds, thousands, into the same or similar roles. Those are the companies that have been doing the hiring. And the, the small businesses, the small retail shops and restaurants that maybe post a job here, post a job there, that most job boards are largely dependent on, those are the companies that have been the, the, the hardest hit. So it wasn't through some, you know, brilliant foresight that we built our business that way, knowing that there was going to be, a, you know, this awful pandemic. It, we're fortunate um, right. in, in, in that sense that we, that we kind of dodged that, that um, budgetary bullet, if, if you will. Well, that's really interesting. Um, I'm really happy to hear that you're doing so well. What kind of jobs are these? Are, are these hmm. like Amazon warehouse jobs or whatever yeah, a lot of a lot of them are are warehouse jobs um we also have um it's there's an interesting mix so some of the gig economy employers stopped advertising altogether like the ride share services you know the the, the lift kinds of companies the uber kinds of companies the the, the, the nobody's going economy, anywhere yeah, it's exactly. Nobody was going anymore, anywhere. And those companies pretty quickly um, did what was right for their quote unquote employees and, and for their customers, where they basically, it's like, you know, we're not going to be providing these services unless it's really necessary. We're going to really cut back on this. So they did a lot of cutbacks in those areas. But at the same time, a lot of the people that were doing that driving shifted to doing you know, Instacart and um, uh, Amazon Fresh, you know, the food deliveries, the grocery deliveries. And so there's, there was a shift in the gig economy from people doing in-person face-to-face services to more of the delivery um, type services. And we saw that with our business, that we had some customers who, rather than hiring people who to drive you, they were hiring people to drive groceries to you. Speaking about disruptive, it seems that that's the adjective du jour this year for just about everything, right, Stephen? So, how, however, it can be said that um, all aspects of college have been disrupted. Uh, no, no question about that. Probably right up there with hospitality and travel. So, what are you hearing from students now? Yeah, so there's, there's, a, there's a real mixture. So like you were saying at the outset, there, there are more than 7,400 schools in the country. Um, one-year schools, two-year schools, four-year schools, you know, masters, et cetera. Um, when you kind of look at the number of campuses out there. And there are probably 7,400 different approaches um, to, to this problem, which is one of the problems, is that we don't have like sort of a, one well-thought-out solution. We have 7,400, which means there's probably only one that's good. The only school that I've seen in the entire country that really seems to be doing a, a good job is the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. They invested a ton of money. They're doing testing multiple times a week. Um, your key card to get into your dorm, libraries, classes, whatever, doesn't work unless you're getting tested. I think it's within four days. Wow. Um, and the results are coming back almost immediately. And even there, um, they had 2,000 students, I think it was, that tested positive within the first two weeks. They thought that would be the number for the first semester. So what we're hearing from students is that they feel vulnerable or that they don't care at all. Um, it's kind of like one extreme or another. Um, that's kind of reflected, I think, in, in society. Their parents and grandparents, a, a lot of us sort of feel the same way. You've got this whole group of people out there. It's like, yeah, it's a real virus, but I don't really care. 
Um, so I'll be sick for a week. You know, I'll be sick. I'll be sick for two days. There's that whole group. And then there's the other group. Um, and I know somebody like this. They literally haven't been out of their house since the beginning of March. Like they have not stepped out of their house. Everything is being delivered to them on the doorstep. They're washing everything down. That's kind of the other extreme. Um, my family is kind of much more in, in, in the middle. So students, some of them are doing distance learning. Um, where they are at home, sometimes in an apartment, um, like our, our daughter goes to McGill University in Montreal, and that's what hers is. So she chose to go back to Montreal with her roommates, but there's nothing on campus or virtually nothing on campus. There may be labs if you're in a lab by yourself. There are other schools that are sort of hybrid models where you might have a class that instead of meeting five days a week in person, they've broken up the class into five segments and, you know, Peter, you might go on Monday with your group of 25 people in a room of five that has a seating for 500. I might go on Tuesday with my 25 cohorts that in that same room. And so it's easy then to physically distance. Um, and those who want to not go on campus at all are then free to, to connect by, by live stream, Zoom, YouTube, whatever they might be using. And then there's a, a small number of schools that uh, just basically don't think that COVID is real. And in, in person, um, in classroom attendance um, is, is required. And I've heard reports of students being um, suspended for the entire semester if they don't show up in the classroom. Those are outliers. They're not even worth dignifying the name of the schools because it's, uh, it's just reprehensible. Yeah. Yeah, no kidding. It's and you know it it just gets to how politicized this whole thing has become, which just blows my mind. I mean, this, yeah. this has nothing to do with politics. It has to do with science and medicine. You know. Yeah, and it. I think it's a. I think the politicization the politicization of the of COVID and how that's impacted recruiting and which businesses are open and how they're open and all of that. I think it's a reflection of how polarized as a society we already were. We were set up for this. As somebody like, the, we're both dual, so I think we have a better appreciation of the fact that the way it is, is in the U.S. is not the way it is in the rest of the world. Right. Um, there are other countries that are similar to us, and, but most are not. It doesn't have to be this way. But right. regardless of what country you're talking about, you're going to have differences of opinion. You're going to have some people who are more worried, other people who are less. You're going to have some people who are caring more about those around them, other people less. Um, I think we see a lot more of that because we're here um, and because the U.S. just in almost any way you slice or dice it, we're, we're, we're like up, up near the top of the list of the worst countries in the world. You know, one of the one of the comments um, on your recent guest appearance with uh, our good friend William Tincup on the Use Case podcast, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, I'll put a link to William's podcast in the show notes. Had to do with internships, and I, I found it really interesting because you said that there are several companies, including I believe PwC, that are uh, doing some very interesting things around internships this year. Can you uh, elaborate on that for us? Yeah, yeah. So PwC and, and also KPMG, um, two of the biggest you know, um, uh, consulting and accounting firms in the world, are, I, I, I don't remember if I use the phrase, but I'll use it here. They're, they're like the poster child for doing like almost everything right that they could. I can't think of anything they did wrong, um, but I, I'm sure if you were to ask them internally off the record, they could look back and they could say, hey, we made 50 decisions and two of them were wrong. I mean, we, it was something you know, crazy, crazy good, which is a real testament also to the quality of the people there, um, the, the, the smarts, the, willing to, the willingness to make the hard decisions. And also, you know, those organizations have, have the monetary resources to make some of the hard decisions that a lot of businesses just didn't. But what they did pretty quickly is that they said to all of the interns that were going to be working for them during the summer of 2021 that you know you're scheduled to be on site in our offices for it's probably 12 weeks something along those lines and you're not coming into the office um, instead what we're doing is that we're going to be giving you um, i think it was typically a two-week virtual internship. You're going to have a project. You're going to work at that at home. We're going to provide you, I believe, with the equipment that you need if you don't have it. 
right? So if you've got, you know, a crappy laptop and that's going to inhibit your performance, they were going to get a laptop to you that would allow you to get the project done. Um, they probably made arrangements for good Wi-Fi for the, for those that, that didn't have that, um, which there is definitely a digital divide in, in, in this country. And every single one of the interns, which were scheduled to work during the summer of 2020, um, received an offer for in, an entry level um, employment offer upon graduation 2021. What I don't think they would use the word, but a lot of people talk about permanent. Uh, you know, uh, and no no job is permanent. Right. Um, but when those students graduate next May, they know that if they choose to do so, they have a job waiting for them at PwC, KPMG, and, and some other companies regardless of what their work performance was like this last summer. They didn't have to pass some kind of a productivity test, which is remarkable. It's just absolutely outstanding what those organizations did. And, and, and they, they needed to be applauded. Um, and and I think I I did a good job. It, it, um, I shared it a lot on social um, and there were like tens of thousands of views, comments, likes, et, et cetera, to them. So yeah, that's, they, that's they definitely really awesome. got the kudos that they deserved, not just for me, but a whole lot of media attention. So uh, I've been fortunate to be involved with College Recruiters Boot Camp for the past couple of years, producing videos at your events, uh, thanks to the sponsorship of Alio. So, Stephen, will there be a uh, virtual boot camp this December? W- what are you going to do? Yeah. So, for those who don't know, we roughly once a year we hold an employer user conference, and it's usually and they're really cool. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. They're they're usually hosted by um, a customer or some kind of a partner um, of ours. So, um, so two years ago, uh, Google hosted it at um, their corporate campus um, in Mountain View in suburban San Francisco. Uh, that the topic or the theme was on artificial intelligence, um, how it's being used in recruiting, how it should be used in recruiting. Last uh, December, um, December 2019, I guess it was, Ernst & Young um, hosted the conference at their uh, corporate offices in, in Hoboken, New Jersey. You know, and that theme was on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, the attendees we usually have somewhere between 100 and 200 senior talent acquisition professionals. So it's not a job fair. It's not for candidates. It's for our customers and people who kind of fit the profile of our customers. You don't have to be a customer of college recruiter to attend. This year, we're not going to have that event. Um, we had it scheduled. We had the, the, the date, the time, the host. Um, all of that was lined up. So rather than being December 2020, we now have the next one tentatively scheduled for December 2021. We did consider doing a virtual event, and there have definitely been some virtual events that I've attended, other you know conference organizers that I thought have done an outstanding job. I've also attended some that are just horrifyingly bad. Yeah, they're like they're like glorified webinars, you know. Uh, oh, at best, uh, <laughs> I mean, it's, I mean, some of them are. It's it's like. It's like torturous to to attend some of them. It's really different when you're in person because even if the presentations aren't all that great, if the presenters and more importantly, your fellow attendees are, that's a good enough reason to go to the event. Right. But when you're just watching, you know, on Zoom with another 150 people and so you can't engage and and there's no interaction between the presenters and the attendees. There's no interaction between the attendees. Um, to me, I, I'm just not interested. Yeah. Um, but there definitely have been some events where somehow the organizers have managed to make it highly interactive, highly engaging, um, really interesting presentations. I think we're all going to, a year from now, be a lot better at this. Than we are today, and and I I am not surprised that uh, you've taken the the the, uh, the path that you've taken as far as as your boot camp as someone who has participated in your events. They're highly interactive. There's a lot of uh, you know discussions going on during presentations that um, 
really lend themselves to the people being in person to have that experience. And you're just not going to get it um, virtually. Yeah, exactly. You know, so, some of the some of the best conferences that I've ever attended, there's actually almost no in interaction because the speakers are just crazy good. Right. The content is great. And you can sit there as an attendee in your chair along with, you know, the other 50 or 500 people in the room. And it's like a fire hose of awesome information coming at you. There doesn't have to be the engagement between the attendees and, and, and the presenters and in between the and, and attendee to attendee, because the content is just so outstandingly great. Our events, the way we built them is, um, or they've kind of evolved into this, is we have 20 minute presentations followed by um, discussions that are about an hour, but sort of like you were alluding to, most of the content does not come from the presenters. Most of the content comes from the attendees. So we'll have a presenter that'll get up there and you know they have six slides in their PowerPoint. They won't even get to slide number three before there's a, there's a very interactive discussion. And you'll have an attendee you know, she'll stick up her hand and she'll say, you know, I'm the vice president of talent acquisition for diversity inclusion at this Fortune 500 company. And, you know, some of what you're saying totally makes sense. We're doing that. But some of what you're saying, we tried that. It didn't work for us. I hear it's working for you. It didn't work for us. You know, why do you think that is? I mean, it's, it, lots of Q&As. And, and we'll get usually within 15, 20 minutes, we'll get attendees sort of swiveling around in their chairs and they're having a discussion with each other. It's almost like a round table to do that on zoom would be a nightmare oh, because God, yeah. you have people <clears throat> talking over each other and nobody would be able to follow what's going on. So I think that the virtual events, when it's, when the content is very one way from mm -hmm. presenter to attendees, maybe somebody monitoring and, and responding to chat those can work, but it's just not at all what how our events are. That's that's so true, and and there's a very good reason you you call them boot camps and not conventions or conferences, because that's exactly what you know that that's the level of conversation that that's happening at these. These are all you know practitioners who are highly involved in the talent acquisition world, and especially at the college level, college yeah. recruiting level. And they are there to glean information and uh, strategies from their peers. I think they should have full accountability. Yeah. So, so the reality is that some companies are a lot more visible. In this room, there's a load of companies with very, very high visibility. And so there's a lot of attention anytime anything actually happens. Uh, the speed with which something uh, that, that would relate to Google or, or Microsoft or Facebook as just three examples uh, is even faster, right? Um, but by, by the same token, the standards ought to be there for them to be able to address that almost instantaneously in an open, transparent way. And we have yet to learn full transparency, what full transparency means. Yeah, I, think, I think we are still years away from being able to be comfortable in sharing income, right? And compensation. Only 27% of the companies in the United States have actually done the calculation on gender parity. The willingness and ability of the attendees to be collaborative blows me away every single time. They, how they will open up um, and just share, you know, we, we, you know, for our internship program, you know, we found that there were 10 things that we needed to do to, to, to make them work really well. And here are those 10 things. And they're sharing that with their competitors for the same talent. Um, and these are three things that we did that were horribly wrong. And let me share that with you as well. I mean, it's just the, 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 the ability for these people to willingly share the good, the bad, and the ugly is just absolutely phenomenal. Yeah, it really is. It's a, it's a, it's a, special, it's a special kind of mix of people there because 
You have people like uh, John Sumser, who's moderating a whole panel of people who are practitioners and vendors, and, and the conversations are are really intense that, that that are created at this. You know, it's it's really fun to participate in it. The ability for these senior level talent acquisition leaders to to really listen and share. So I want I want to return to our for college students for a minute, because uh, I know you've been blogging about the rising cost of college tuition and the fact that, you know, many of the universities are charging the same for virtual mm. as being on campus. And can you e explain why? It's all about you know, the Benjamins. Don't they, like a discount from working from home. It's all about the Benjamins and, and Benjamins meaning currency. Um, for, you know, if anybody's like abroad and doesn't understand the reference, the, the higher education in the U.S. started to really undergo a major change in starting, I think, like in the 60s or 70s, so a little bit before my time. Um, I went to college in the 80s. I was in grad school in the early 90s. The grad school that I went to, University of Minnesota uh, Law School, my tuition in my final year was $3,500. <laughs> I talked to somebody two years ago now who was considering going there and his tuition for his first year, so it would escalate after that, was $38,000. So it had gone up, you know, what, 11, 12 fold in, you know, a few decades. There's no other industry where you've seen that kind of price escalation except for healthcare. And healthcare... For most people, those costs are not borne by the consumer. They're borne by your insurance company and then indirectly by the consumer because then the insurance company charges the employer, the government, whatever. But the reality is, is that consumers have not paid the bulk of those cost escalations on the healthcare side, but they do pay all of it in education. So education to me is the worst industry. The, the, the underlying reason for it, uh, reasons, there, there, there are a number of them, but one of them is that the, in the U.S., um, you've got private schools, which are just like corporations. Sometimes they're nonprofits, sometimes they're for-profits, um, and they've always sort of function very bottom line oriented. Um, you also have what are called um, state schools, um, land grant schools, where individual states would literally donate land and a university was created. And the, and the understanding was, is that the university was a public institution owned by the government. And it was, its mission was to educate the residents of that state. And over the last 30, 40 years, very few of those schools have followed that mission. The states have cut back funding tremendously. It wasn't uncommon in the 60s and 70s for a state school to receive 60, 70, 80% of its budget from the state government. Now they're getting 10, 15, 20%. So they needed to make up that money someplace. At the same time, the federal government stepped in. And in my view, as a subsidy to the big banks, to the financial institutions, the federal government started to, to guarantee the repayment of student loans. So the banks had no risk. If the student didn't repay them, then the, gov then the federal government would, which then made banks happy to lend you what Ever amount of money you needed to go to school because their risk was nothing. The interest rates are far higher for a student loan than they are for any other kind of comparable debt. Mortgage interest rates, interest rates are call it three and a half percent. That you know you walk away from the mortgage, they take your house. But if you owe more on your mortgage and your house is worth, the bank has some exposure there. Yeah. Student debt, the bank has no exposure because the federal government's guaranteeing 100% of it. So it's a zero risk loan. And yet student debt is 8% rather than 3.5%. Why? Because, because it can be. Um, so what's happened over the last few decades is that the schools are getting less funding. They're shifting the cost to the students through the form of student loans. And the schools became really sophisticated at marketing. They started to realize a couple decades ago that when students are choosing which school to go to, they're not looking at outcomes data. They're not looking at, oh, if I go to this school, that's going to get me into this kind of job and this kind of salary and blah, blah, blah. In, 
they look at that, but far more important is, oh, it'd be so fun to go to school there. Mm -hmm. Um, My friends are going there. My parents want me to go there because that's where they went. Or it'll make, if if I go to a really big brand name school, then my parents are going to feel that they're more important than they actually are. So my parents are putting pressure on me um, or I've just been raised to want to wanna go to a brand name school. And that reduces price sensitivity. So the schools can jack up your tuition because you're basically buying a premium brand. It's like first adopters. The people who got the very first iPhones paid way more than the people who, who were more price sensitive and waited a couple of years. Um, and that's kind of what schools are, are uh, that they're in. So it's not at all unusual for a student to attend uh, I'm a school that's twenty five, fifty, even seventy thousand dollars a year for tuition, and then you add on top of that usually ten to fifteen thousand dollars a year for for room and board. So a lot of families out there for four year schools are paying fifty thousand dollars a year for four years. So that's two hundred thousand dollars, and if they've got three kids, that's six hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, that's crazy. I mean, it's and and when you look abroad, that the equivalent might be twenty thousand dollars i mean right. it's just it's it's completely yeah, Europe, night Europe and day. is so much better than yeah do. my god what what i think is we're starting to see because of covid though and with more and more students attending virtually is all that fun stuff the fun residence halls the student unions the on-campus clubs and sports with covid that stuff is either non-existent or really greatly diminished. So why would you pay $60,000 a year to go to a fun school when you can't have any fun there versus $6,000 a year and still get a degree that's worth the same to the vast majority of employers? So if the schools don't get this fixed, then I think you're going to see massive upheaval within a year or two. And I think that COVID in so many areas of society has just fundamentally changed the way that we do things. You know, it's just not that important anymore to people to go for their morning cup of coffee at a Starbucks or whatever, or to go out for dinner three times a week. Um, And, you know, people in, in, in certain areas, like if you have a studio part in Manhattan, you're pretty likely to go out for food every meal um, or were at least until COVID hit. Now people are like, Oh, I can cook. Um, I can do takeout. And that's mm-hmm. take up might be $7 rather than $17. I think that's going to be happening with schools. I think you're going to see the tier ones um, doing well. Um, the, you know, the Ivy League schools, the big brand name schools. I don't think there's going to be much of an impact on them because there's such a long waiting list for them. The tier two schools, like where I went, University of Minnesota, I think there's going to be some impact there. But still, the waiting lists are probably long enough that they're OK. It's the tier three schools. Right. That are going to be in real trouble. I think you're going to see hundreds of those closing within the next year or two. Yeah, there's not going to be 7,400 colleges or universities in right. two years, right? Right. Yeah. Um, and good. Yeah. Um, I, 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 a lot of those schools were just ripping off students. So the, the, the value of the education was just was just not there. Um, with with a lot of those third tier schools, I think. So I think you'll see a lot more students attending the MITs, the University of Minnesota's, University of Illinois and whatever through distance learning. And I think that's a big opportunity for those schools. So University of Illinois could probably charge somebody $10,000 a year for distance learning, you know, on campus is $25,000 a year. And there'll be people who will choose to go on campus for that. But then, you know, they, rather than having 40,000 students, they can have 400,000 students. Well, you know, that brings up another topic that I'd love for you to talk about. And, you know, another blog topic on collegerecruiter.com has been taking a gap year. And, you know, Mm -hmm. that certainly has been in the news. And uh, given the number of students that have decided to take a gap year rather than pay for a year of no on campus, anything like you were talking about. So what what can you tell us about the prevalence of this and and the pros and the cons of, of taking a gap year? Yeah. I, this is one of the many areas where I was dead, where I was dead wrong. (laughs) I make lots of mistakes every day. And this was one of them. I thought there would be a lot of people taking a gap year this year and it really hasn't happened. And, and looking back, uh, my, my thinking was just poor gap years make a ton of sense when there's something good as an alternative as, as an American, if you want to travel abroad, 
you can now do so with, with most countries. A few months ago, they wouldn't let you in. Right. Now, now, now they will. But now what they're doing with most countries is that you have a 10 to 14 day strict quarantine. Right. So you go there, you can't leave your apartment, you can't leave your Airbnb, you can't leave your hotel room, and they're checking up on you. You know, unlike in the US, you know, when my, my daughter went back to Montreal, we were looking at this and they stayed in their apartment. They didn't leave their apartment for 14 days, her and her two roommates. They well, had that's friends what you're saying, because the signs up in Canada are... Yeah, I mean, if you have a dog, it's like, too bad. The dog's going to poop in the apartment. I mean, it's just, wow. you cannot walk the dog, period. End of story. The $1,200 Canadian fine for your first violation, it's about $900 US. Your second violation is $750,000 Canadian. It's something like $550,000 US. And they've assessed those fines. I was reading a few weeks ago, guy in Banff got hit with a $750,000 fine for his second violation. Um, so you to go abroad when you're going to have to be quarantined um, for that length of time, how do, how do you travel from, you can't backpack across the, you know, across Europe or go from Thailand to, you know, Indonesia or whatever. It's just, because every time you go to a different country, you're going to have to quarantine. Um, so it, that just makes that infeasible. Um, the job market is still pretty bad right? Um, in, in, in most sectors for, for, you know, for, for most people. So it's not even like, well, if I take a gap year, then I can work for a year in my career path. Um, that's also hard. We definitely are seeing people who, students who are taking a gap year, who are working um, often for pretty good pay at, at places like an Amazon warehouse or driving or, or doing something along those lines, um, healthcare. So there definitely is some of that. But I think as it got closer to the start of school, the bulk of students and their parents were making a rational decision that there, there isn't a good alternative. So go to school, stay busy. You're going to just be kind of in the same boat as, as your friends and, and other people who are progressing um, along too. It's not an ideal year for anyone. You're going to miss out on a lot of stuff, but better than staying at home, you know, just playing on your Xbox and watching YouTube. What do college st seniors need to do now to find a good job after they graduate next year in 2021? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. Um, employers, the vast majority of employers care more about your work experience than they do about the school you go to, the major that you're in, your grades. That's really hard for a typical young adult to grasp because all through their life, they've been taught to excel at school. And now for the first time, it's not school that matters as much as it is their work performance. So another thing that's hard for a lot of young adults to grasp and even their parents is that most employers don't care that your work history was paid or was unpaid. What they really care about is being able to look at your credentials and feel confident that you're gonna be able to do the work that they're hiring you for. And so if you're an accounting major and you're in your senior year, get an internship, a part-time job, a seasonal job, whatever, in accounting. And that might just be working for an H&R block doing tax returns. Because if you can do those tax returns well, whether H&R Block offers you a permanent position upon graduation or it's a regional accounting firm, that accounting firm is going to be able to look and say, oh, that was accounting work and you did a good job. We're confident that you can do the work here. Um, if you're in hospitality and you want to be a, uh, a sous chef, there might not be a restaurant that's hiring sous chefs right now. But Chipotle is hiring people. And the work that you would be doing in the kitchen at Chipotle is very similar to the work that you would be doing in a four-star restaurant, you know, preparing food, cutting up vegetables, cutting up meat, whatever. So go to work for Chipotle. That kind of 
um, more flexible attitude about the kind of job that you have is, is better. Uh, if you're looking for a, a customer service kind of a role where you're interacting a lot with customers, you, maybe you can't get paid to do that. But there certainly would be a lot of nonprofits that would be happy to have your help handling customer calls, et cetera. Um, small businesses, you know, your, your local vet, your local doctor's office, whatever, um, they need people. And some of them are going to be nonprofits. Some of them are just going to be tiny little businesses. Um, volunteer your time for them or, or be willing to take minimum wage. Um, where in a normal year, maybe you'd be looking for $18 an hour right now. If you get 10, you're good. So uh, I would really look at what skills that your employer next spring is going to be looking for and then back up from there. What kinds of employers are offering work like that now? If you can get paid work, awesome. If it's highly paid, fantastic. But if you have to volunteer even five hours a week, do that. It doesn't have to be full time. You know, something else I've been wondering about with you know recent college graduates, I mean, you look at the number of people working at home today, right? Mm -hmm. um, so do you think the, the current reliance on work, uh, work from home is going to have an impact on staffing and employment, especially at the recent grad level? I, I do, and it'll be really interesting to sort of see what are the shorter-term ramifications and what are the really long-term ramifications. So I've been an advocate for years of trying to, I think the word is decouple, separate employment from healthcare. I think as a society, 100 years from now, I think we're going to look back and we're going to regret that the 70s and 80s where employers stepped in and provided health benefits to employees as a way, it was very calculated. It wasn't evil. It was just, it, would, it made sense. It was rational from an employer, an employer to say, hey, Peter, if you work for us and we provide you with health insurance, you're going to be less likely to quit and go and work for someone else, right? And right. you were like, hey, I can get health insurance for free and it's a good plan. Why would I say no to that? So it worked on both sides uh, in some ways. The problem with it is now you're locked in. It makes it really hard for you to leave that employer and go somewhere else. If pre-existing conditions become a thing again, um, and the current administration has made public remarks saying that they are fighting to keep pre-existing conditions covered, but in court, they're trying to, they're trying to get rid of pre-existing conditions from being covered. If pre-existing conditions become a thing again, um, and everybody who has COVID, uh, which is going to end up probably being, well, a sizable minority of us, maybe a majority of us, that's all. That's going to be a pre-existing condition. So every heart issue you have, every lung issue, every, you know, just about any kind of health issue, an insurance will be able, insurance company for the rest of your life will be able to come back and say, no, that's not covered because you had COVID or you can't prove you didn't have COVID. That is, is another thing that, that could happen. So that I think... As people work, as more and more people work from home, they're going to become decoupled from their employer. The work, the way we approach work, who we interact with, I think will be more like independent contractors. We're not going to think of ourselves as being in this big company because we never go to that company. Instead, we're going to be in these little work pods. It's my boss. It's my four coworkers. And that's, those are going to be the people that you mostly interact with. You're not going to go to work and see a thousand people. You're going to go to work through Zoom and stuff, and you're going to interact with 10. Um, and I think people are going to feel less tied to their work. And they're going to feel, I, I think, more and more employers and more and more employees are going to move to independent contractor type relationships, project-based work. Um, and that's going to decouple health insurance from, from employers. So uh, I uh, long term, and I'm talking 10 years from now, 20 years from now, I think there are going to be a lot more people working from home, project based, or working on like a long term contract for an employer. I'm already actually seeing this, Peter, and maybe you are too, in talent acquisition. Mm -hmm. 
a whole lot of talent acquisition people I know, some of them just exceptionally good people were laid off in March and April. Yep. Just, I mean, I, some of these people, it's like, you have got to be kidding me. You're like a rock star in, in our industry and you were laid off. There's no way it was that person's fault. It was just the company was in risk of shutting down. So everybody got laid off or furloughed. Some of those people are coming back and I'm seeing job titles on LinkedIn as like talent acquisition consultant. Um, you know, words like that, that lead me to believe that these people are on contracts, yep. probably working from home, many of them for the first time in their lives. And I just can't imagine if they're on a one year contract the year from now, that they're going to feel this burning desire to go back into an office every day. Yeah. I mean, um, they're living the same kind of experience that a lot of sourcers have had for, for years now, right? The, the same kind of setup where you, you're doing contract work, you may be six months or a year uh, on a specific project, and then you go on to do something else. Yeah. And that's and, been the sourcing world forever. A- absolutely. And, and, you know, that said, I, there are some organizations out there that, although they're sourcing, recruiting, talent acquisition, HR people have largely sometimes entirely worked from home, they still seem to have a bond to the company. And I think that's the culture of the company. Those companies have worked harder. The managers have worked harder to create that bond with their teammates, with their direct reports, with their supervisors. Two examples of that. One would be Amazon. We keep mentioning them. Mm -hmm. Um, The recruiting people uh, work remotely. And they have, I mean, for forever, that's just been the way that, that Amazon has done it. And that's, they've been able to tap into a whole group of people that it's like, Hey, if you live in Chicago, there's no reason why you can't do the staffing for San Francisco. You don't have to be in San Francisco to do staffing for San Francisco. Um, Another one is Sodexo for as long as I can remember their, their talent acquisition team have worked remotely. But when you talk to any one of them, I never get the feeling that they think of themselves as being free agents or independent contractors. Absolutely not. They are part of the Sodexo team and they have a, you know, a, a, a community between them. There's, there's a tie. And I think it's a testament to the people that they have working where they've worked hard in ways to, to ensure that they have that collaborative nature. It's not easy to do when we, we, I think I was saying earlier, everybody at College Recruiters worked remotely since 1997. We've had people who have worked with us who were exceptionally good in an office environment and exceptionally bad at working from home. Um, sometimes it's just the physical setup. Yeah. You know, you're, if you're working on your kitchen table and you've got three toddlers running around, good luck to you. Yeah. Um, and other people, um, everybody in our company now, they're way more productive because they work at home. They, they don't get interrupted as much. They're able to focus. If they want to have music on while they're working, they can do it. Um, and if they want to microwave fish for lunch, and, and nobody's going to complain. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, back back to uh, what we were talking about earlier with your last boot camp at EY in in Hoboken, which had all had to do with diversity and inclusion. Has the focus on hiring a more diverse workforce, especially at large organizations, the kind of companies that you traditionally work with, um, has that impacted college recruiting? Yeah. And that's, that's really interesting, Peter. So if it, if 2020 was just about COVID, then I suspect we would have seen less of an emphasis on diversity, equity, and inclusion, because it's, it's hard to hire people from home. And if people are working from home, they're going to tend to be more independent. And so the fact that you're a woman or black or a veteran or disabled or whatever probably isn't as important when, when you're working remotely. But at pretty much the same time, we had just miles away from where I live, we had George Floyd being killed by the Minneapolis Police Department right. and Breonna Taylor and, you know, all, all of all of these other, you know, awful incidents, 
those incidents have caused most of these Fortune 500 government agency um, customers that we work with a lot to be much more uh, aggressive in their efforts to, to recruit and retain um, a diverse, equitable, and inclusive workforce. Um, in years past, I would say that a sizable minority, maybe a majority of those organizations would talk about diversity, would spend money that way, but weren't really committed. It was more of a, we need to do this. Now, PR stunt kind of thing. Yeah, PR yeah. stunt, uh, check the box, compliance. Um, I want to be able to look in the mirror at night and feel like I'm a good person, even if I don't, even if I'm really not. <laughs> you know, we all have some of that, of course, but, you know, we all want to be better people. But, but you know, in our work lives sort of only goes so far. Uh, what I'm seeing now is not, is, is, is a difference. It's not about, we want to be a more diverse organization because it's the right thing to do for society. What a lot of the advocates of diversity over the years have been trying to sell to companies is yes, it's the right thing to do for society, but it's also the right thing to do for your business. That the more diverse your organization, the more productive is your organization. And I think that more companies have finally come to internalize that, to really see that and to believe that. So just before we jumped on this call, um, one of the large banks in, in the country asked for a proposal and the language that they used in their request, it wasn't at all like it would have been a year ago. It was absolutely, you know, we are all in, we are not nearly diverse enough. We, we can see that some of our decisions, I mean, they're like sharing stuff with me, like, dude, you don't have to get into showing me all your dirty laundry, but it was fascinating to read all of the problems that they're having in their business because they don't have a diverse workforce. And so they're realizing it's not just about compliance. It's not just about public relations. It's that they're at a competitive disadvantage because everybody there looks like you or me, white dudes. And, right. and they need to have women. They need to have uh, people who are black, Native American, whatever. Um, and um, and they, they also specifically are looking for people with disabilities. And that's something that we rarely see, um, uh, unfortunately. So well, I, that's I, certainly one of the advantages of work from home, right? For for people who have disabilities, absolutely. And you know absolutely. what's what's really interesting, Stephen, is for years these companies have saying, "Oh, you can't work from home. You have to come into the office because of X, Y, or Z." And then it, it would be impossible for you to do this job at home. And now these companies are going, "Hey, people are more productive. <laughs> you know, right. they're happier. Uh, we have less." Uh, churn of our staff and um uh, we're saving money we're yes, saving I, money and, and uh, as soon as you say that that gets everybody's attention right yep and and you know a lot of us including me we've had we've had virtual doctor visits now right you don't yeah, me too you don't have to take half a day out of your life to go into the doctor's office to meet with a doctor for eight minutes to get a prescription you know for a sinus infection you can jump on zoom you know, she spends 10, 10 minutes, you spend 10 minutes, she can see more patients and you can go about your normal life. And guess what? If I have a sinus infection, I'm not going to infect the person in the waiting room who's there because they have a hangnail. Um, you know, so all of that stuff that was, oh, it's impossible. Ah, you know, may, maybe it wasn't so impossible after all. Um, I yeah. do think, I'm, I'm confident that we're going to, the pendulum's going to switch back. Right. It would be really nice to see you and others in person in the same room again. Oh, absolutely. But I, I think don't think when, that's when, going to happen in, until late next year sometime. I, I suspect you're right. I, I, I kind of feel like we're living with this environment through roughly this time next year. Mm -hmm. um, I hear people talking about eradicating COVID. The only disease that humankind has ever eradicated is smallpox. 
There's been nothing else. So I don't know why we would think that we're going to completely get rid of COVID if we haven't gotten rid of polio. Uh, um, so I think it's going to be something we're going to have to live with. Yeah. Um, I, I have one last question about diversity. Uh, yeah. So are, are different colleges getting targeted now from, you know, the usual suspects, specifically such as predominantly African-American colleges? Yeah. So this is fascinating to me. Uh, yes. Um, really? So one of, one of our biggest customers is a U.S. government intelligence agency. They've always emphasized diversity hiring. This year, with the campaigns they're running with us, they've taken it to a completely other level. They are not just the HBCUs, the historically black colleges and universities. People who talk about diverse schools almost always talk about HBCUs. And, and there are, you know, depending on how you count them, 100 plus of them but also tribal colleges and universities, which you almost never hear employers talking about, schools that are predominantly attended by Native Americans. And there are um, um, HACU schools, which are uh, his Hispanic schools uh, or schools that primarily serve that audience. And there are Asian Pacific schools or schools that have a high proportion of, of Asian and Pacific Islanders attending them. This employer has emphasized all of those with a much higher percentage of their budget than, than they have in years past. Conversely though, what I'm seeing from corporate America is a de-emphasis on those schools. And it's not to say that they are uninterested in hiring people who are black or women or, or whatever, they're just doing it in a different way. Um, so what we're seeing is more and more employers are becoming school and even major agnostic, meaning we don't really care what school you went to. We don't even really care all that much what, what your major was. Um, one of our big customers, uh, an accounting and consulting company, that the head of recruiting there said to me that, that we can teach a candidate how to read a balance sheet. What we can't teach them how to do is to think critically. So they found years ago that when they hired liberal arts majors from second tier schools, that they outperformed accounting majors from first year schools. And the reason was is that those accounting majors from first year schools, they'd only last a couple of years and then they'd job hop and go on someplace else. The liberal arts major might be with them for five or 10 years. So there's better productivity from that liberal arts major. What we're seeing on sort of the diversity side is employers are waking up to the fact that they can reach students who are black, veteran, female, whatever, at any school. If you want to hire people who are black, awesome. You do not have to do that by exclusively recruiting at HBCUs. You know, even at University of Minnesota where I went, something like 10% of the students at a school in Minnesota are black. So you can target black school students anywhere, disabled, veteran, female, whatever. When you're not going on campus, it becomes easier to do that. If you can only go to 20 schools and you really want to increase the number of people who are black who are working in your company, then you pretty much have to go to the HBCUs. Um, but now that employers aren't recruiting on campus, it's, it's not about like where the students are for them to physically go to them. It's who are the students. It's, a, it's about reaching that demographic. You can recruit black students from a school in Wyoming. One last question for you, and I really appreciate your time today, Stephen. Um, what would you like to share, particularly with college students that we haven't discussed? Well, with college students, the, the biggest sort of information gap that I see they have, and a lot of this is because my wife and I have three kids. A couple of them are sort of past the traditional age of college. One of them is just finishing up. But when, when we talk to them and more importantly to their friends, um, the information that they tend to receive from their parents, I'm a Gen Xer, but like call it Gen X and baby boomer parents that pass it on to now it's, lar it's a largely Gen Z audience. The parents talk to their kids about what career path to take based upon what they're good at. If you're good with numbers, you should be an accountant. That's basically where the advice stops. That's not where it should stop. Um, we talk about three things. Look at your competencies, what you're good at. Look at your interests and look at your values. 
So you might be really good at math, but not interested in it. So in that case, don't become an accountant. Uh, maybe you want to go into advertising and be working with programmatic job feeds where things are paid for by click. That's very math oriented. Um, is maybe your values are such that you think it's really important to help employers minimize their advertising spend and hire the most candidates as quickly as they can, in which case programmatic's awesome. Maybe you could care less about that and you want to save puppies. Um, so to, to don't just look at what you're good at. Also really pay attention to what you're interested in and what you care about and look for things that all three of those line up. Um, some people have said to me that there's a fourth characteristic and I think they're right. I just haven't kind of worked it into the language yet, um, but that's also compensation. Um, it's kind of yeah. important for most people to be in a job that they're good at, that they care about, that's important to them and that pays the bills. Um, that's right. If you can work for $40,000 a year and pay your bills and you're happy, then don't work for $80,000 a year in a job that's going to make you miserable. Um, conversely, if you need $40,000 a year to live, then don't be looking at jobs that are paying 30 um, because you're just going to have to quit. You're going to have to quit to find a better job. That's, uh, that's great advice, Stephen. Well, again, thank you very much for taking time to speak with us. Um, it's been really fun. Uh, please uh, send my best to your lovely CEO. And uh, I look forward to seeing you in person at some point uh, in the not too distant future. I hopefully, hopefully we will see each other next year and, and give each other a hug and say, hey, we're coming out on the other side of all this. That would be great. It's been, a, it's been an, an interesting year. Yes, it has. <laughs>